Okay. Okay. We're ready to go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back with Gilda's group and see some friendly faces and um, and some new faces as well. It's really exciting um, to be together again, given everything that we've been through. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name um, is Dr. Faye Lubaki. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and ethicist at the University of Chicago. I uh, specialize in psychosocial oncology. So the care of, of uh, patients and survivors and caregivers, as well as oncology clinicians. Um, I'm a native Chicagoan, uh, born and bred on the South Side. And I've always had a long, long time affinity with Gilda since I was uh, a resident down at Jesse Brown VA. That's when I got a chance to know uh, Kathy Boss. And so that's quite a, quite a long time that we've, uh, we've been having a great friendship and really we're a family at Gilda. So it's such an honor and pleasure to be with you. It's a privilege to always be with you and to learn from you as well. So hopefully this series will um, be beneficial for you. Um, so just would like to welcome you to that. And I, I know that there are some friendly faces and in case you don't feel comfortable introducing yourself, I just, I love to hear um, from a couple of you, maybe just, you know, your first name and where you're from. And, uh, you know, we all love, foods or, or um, maybe what's your favorite started, if that would be all right. So thank you for those that share. Um, we'll just talk about a little bit about the objectives today is to, to present the common um, psychosocial challenges that are experienced by patients and survivors of cancer um, that are uh, certainly patients that are on active therapy as well as those that um, have ceased therapy and, and are in longer term recovery. Also to introduce what is called mindfulness. I'm sure you heard a lot about it in the media, but it's a very old practice and it's been empirically validated. Lots and lots of science behind it. So it's not just a fad that you might be thinking, but it's all about mindfulness, stress-based reduction and cognitive therapy. And this is really the introduction to um, a four-part series um, where we'll provide mindfulness strategies um, as well as ideas on how, how to address and cope with the psychosocial challenges that, again, all the way from time of diagnosis to survivorship. Okay, so let's begin cancer treatment and recurrence. We know that all stages of the cancer trajectory, this journey that, that you are on, it significantly impacts one's quality of life. Um, certainly many experience impaired physical functioning, um, it, regarding symptoms like pain and fatigue and sleep disturbances, nausea, as well as psychological anxiety and depression, psychosocial issues, um, you know, the, um, thoughts of self-image um, have changed your social support. Maybe your perceptions of social support has changed. Um, maybe it's greater, maybe it's less. So certainly we know psychosocial support is needed across the cancer trajectory from time of diagnosis well into long-term survivorship, those that are out five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, but again, it really this type of care or the support, it really is just viewed as a form of self-care for any cancer patient and survivor. And um, it is not just needed, but it, it's really a necessary part to, to enhance this quality of life that's been adversely impacted by treatment and cancer and the recurrence. So, and many can experience what's called psychosocial distress. Um, and this really refers to that relationship between our social conditions and the psychological conditions. So how does the patient feel about the way her disease or treatment has affected her own social functioning, for example, at work, at home, in relationship with the spouse, with children, with extended family and friends? You know, so many patients have told me anecdotally, this is a new, newfound sense of normal, so to speak. Um, you, you'll never be that same person again, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it impacts you negatively, there could be also a, a positive benefit from that, the new meaning and growth. But yet distress can still exist even if you're feeling that, that meaning and growth. And it's distinct from the physical effects of cancer and chemotherapy, yet it's linked to the physicality of the disease and treatments. And we certainly know that psychological disorders are associated with cancer diagnosis. Some of it is just might be adjustment disorders, what you may have heard. Um, some of us may experience depression and anxiety, PTSD, that also can contribute or worsen this distress. 
So you might say, what is this distress? Well, believe, believe it or not, the scientists have come with this very busy, busy definition, but I thought I'd just present a little bit to you so that you might um, be able to um, understand a little bit more about distress. It's really multifaceted and it's an unpleasant emotional experience that involves the psychological, so that's our cognitive, our behavior, our emotional, our social, that's very spiritual in nature and it, and it really interferes our ability to cope effectively with cancer, sometimes the symptoms, the treatment, and, and distress in itself is along the continuum. And it can be very normal feelings of vulnerability, sadness and fears to problems that become very disabling, such as depression, anxiety, panic, social isolation, and, and ex ex existential and spiritual crisis as well. And why is that? It's because of these periods of vulnerability, uh, these, these times of awaiting first for a diagnosis, awaiting for a treatment, the side effects that um, one may experience that impacts the ability to perform everyday activities. And debilitating symptoms may warrant psychosocial intervention and treatment. And that includes certainly psychological, social, um, and that. So there certainly is a need to move beyond just symptom control. This journey, this cycle, this cancer journey, um, when, we, when we think about psychosocial distress, many patients have described it as a roller coaster ride, produces turbulence ups and downs. Each part of the journey from pre-diagnosis through post-treatment has its own psychosocial phases. From that first fear experience before the diagnosis is confirmed to that unease and anxiety when that constant monitoring and support in the treatment and that, and that support by the team, that journey can be very much a, a difficult and challenging one. So Jimmy Holland, who created the field, the psychosocial oncology fields that psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists um, are trained within when it comes specifically to the psychosocial care of cancer patients, she, um, she was great. She realized her husband was an oncologist and she just realized that, you know, these patients really need more, more help and care. And she really created this realm, but she was so beautiful. And she identified that every person brings unique characteristics to dealing with an illness, a particular personality, a way of coping, a set of beliefs and values, and a way of looking at the world. The goal is to take these qualities into consideration, make sure they work in favor of that person at each point in their cancer journey. So we all have gifts and skills and innate traits that, that can actually help us, help us with these challenges. It's just really important for us to, oops, identify what that is. Apologize. Uh, computers are quick. Um, so what is pre-diagnosis? So just for us to understand, this is the time preceding that where there's a confirmed diagnosis of cancer and it may cause uh, feelings of anxiety and sadness. And certainly physical symptoms uh, may occur during this time, pain, weight loss or gain, for example, bloating, changes in bowel habits, bleeding. And it's a time of uncertainty, a time of questions, a time of unknowing, lots of waiting, lots of medical tests. Um, new diagnoses that, that um, one may fear can arise as a result of, of this time. And it's a, that expectation of, of health change to a world where certain feelings of uncertainty only remain. What if, what will be, will, is, is a common question. And it becomes a period that's only defined by these tests, this waiting until that diagnosis of cancer is confirmed. And this is well documented, uh, for example, in our, in our uh, Bible, what's called the psycho-oncology, psychosocial care of, of cancer patients that's um, used in worldwide by our clinicians. So diagnosis, this is a time, and many of you can, can probably tell us far, far better than, than any of us um, that describe it, but certainly receiving a cancer diagnosis is devastating. Life becomes divided into two parts, the before diagnosis and the after. And one mourns that loss of pre-cancer healthy self. Certainly there's a grieving process that occurs. A lot of loss of control, which arises as anxiety and these immediate thoughts on death and the impact on families. And some may want to know almost obsessively, why me? What did I do to bring this on? I eat well, I don't smoke, why me? I exercise, et cetera, et cetera. And as I tell many, many patients, even if you would never get the answer to this question, there's, it's a multitude of factors as to why cancer occurs. Denial is a very, very common response. 
not me, it's not happening, I don't have cancer. Um, and really, I, I think it's not denial, but avoidance of the situation, because many of us can, can process it, but we're really avoidant of it. And little time between that diagnosis and start of treatment, it's really rapid fire. As soon as one is diagnosed immediately, it's either surgery or chemo, chemotherapy or radiation. And many describe it as a period of crisis. Um, research shows that there's lots of fears associated with death and dying, anxiety about side effects of treatment, confused by the reality and the language of a new world, um, and really having to be very dependent on, on the team. And many describe obsessive thoughts about the diagnosis that can occur, resulting in sleeplessness, anomia, eating problems. These are normal and common responses to the news of cancer. Treatment itself is about the fear of the unknown. Most patients associate chemotherapy with extreme nausea, vomiting, general discomfort. And it's a time from diagnosis to that initial treatment, which is surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, very, very short, very abrupt, almost not enough time to, to um, take note of what is occurring. Um, and some are recovering from invasive surgery when they're faced with rigors of chemotherapy or radiation, and many experience uh, side effects, loss of hair, such as fatigue, sexual dysfunction, neuropathy, loss of libido, vag vaginal dryness for uh, women's cancers, flu-like uh, symptoms, constipation, urinary incontinence are, are really some of the pri uh, primary uh, priority symptoms that patients tell us that they experience, may experience. And post-treatment, so there's this, as, as patients tell us, this return to a new normality, right? No more side effects, um, but very much a stressful time for some, some women, for, for many men as well. Um, there's a loss of constant monitoring of, of the healthcare team. And there's the fear of recurrence by follow-up testing, which can impact anxiety. There's the adjustment to sexual health, for example, physical and emotional, a loss of libido, routine positive outcomes though can, can occur. And, and that's the hope after post-treatment that many, many patients tell us, whole host of thousands of patients, for example, breast cancer patients tell us that they've, they've developed a new meaning and purpose and, and fulfillment in life because they really have survived this, this greater trauma, this greater appreciation in life, this change in value, spiritual life, intimacy, and, and communication with partners um, that can change but can also become much better as well. Um, so again, lots of the psychosocial social challenges for cancer recurrence survivorship, very much the same. We presented some of them, but it's that emotional well-being, it's altered body images, sexual functioning, it's changed relationships with family and friends, financial concerns, functional well-being and quality of life, fear of recurrence, spiritual well-being, and certainly stress, which is what um, today will be really focused on. And Many folks ask, well, what is stress? I hear that term, but what is it really? And the American Psychological Association, their definition is, is pretty simple. It's that physiological or psychological response to internal or external stressors or stimuli. So that stimulus can, of course, be cancer. And that stress involves changes that, uh, that affects nearly every system of the body, influences how people feel and they behave. For example, it may be manifested by palpitation, sweating, dry mouth, shortness of breath, fidgeting, accelerated speech, augmentation of some negative emotions if they already experienced longer duration of stress fatigue. And that severe stress is manifested by a general adaptation syndrome. So here's some, some lingo that, that can um, that can be uh, complicated. But simply put, it's just these mind-body changes. And stress contributes directly to that psychological and physiological disorder and disease and impacts our, our mental, our physical health, and again, impacts that quality of life. So how do we handle stress? I don't know about you. I always get it in the neck. Tension in neck, jaw, and shoulders. For me, it's in the neck and the shoulders usually. Um, uh, you may feel angry. You may feel depressed or anxious. Um, there's always an over uh, a reaction sometimes associated, short fuse, you, you know, kind of the, the temper tantrum, so to speak, many people will describe. Um, forgetful, can't really make decisions or think clearly. It's very difficult to even just think about paying one's bill, for example. Feeling guilty or inadequate, overindulging by eating or drinking too much, and checking out by withdrawal. These are very common but yet unhelpful ways to handle the stress and particularly when it's a stress associated with the cancer. Chronic stress, we know long-term stress. 
um, can damage mental and physical health. So certainly in the development of heart disease and cancer and digestive issues and cognitive um, issues and emotional reactivity, that long-term anger, depression, anxiety, and it can result in self-medication, overeating alcohol and drugs if left unaddressed. Um, so this helps us to understand why we might think about mindfulness um, and what mindfulness is and this kind of journey that we'll be on for the next four weeks. But today is definitely an introduction. Um, I hope that you'll come back or at least um, you'll come back to the recorded sessions um, because for many of us, it's all about self-care and well-being, and that's what mindfulness is. And certainly at any point in time in the cancer journey, mindfulness can be very, very helpful and beneficial. So what is mindfulness meditation, that focus attention um, and that? Our, the first step is really all about awareness, stress, and automatic pilot. So think about when, when we looked at those symptoms of stress and, and what was that whole background associated with stress, all that language. Mindfulness really helps us get out of that habitual automatic pilot mode, you know, where you're constantly going, going, going. For example, with the going of the cancer treatment and, and, and that, we do a lot of things automatically out of routine. Think about if you've ever been driving somewhere and suddenly you're at your home and you don't even really remember how you got there. Um, were you supposed to pick somebody up or not? You just immediately went automatically home. Has that ever happened to you? I know it's happened to me. Um, doing these things automatically can be incredibly helpful, um, but, but in essence, we're almost not paying attention to, to the world. But if we constantly live our lives on this automatic pilot, if we're just going from one thing to the next without even noticing, um, we're not experiencing, we're missing out a great deal on our lives. So what is mindfulness? Many of you know, again, this is something also very much uh, presented in the media, um, especially with the mental health crisis that's occurring now, um, generally as a result of COVID. Um, you'll, you'll hear, well, mindfulness is a great tool. Well, this has actually been used um, quite, a, quite a long time, but a simple definition by John Kabat-Zinn, who was um, a microbiochemist at, in Massachusetts who decided to use this longtime meditator. I uh, used to go to Asia quite a bit. And he, he used this on patients with back pain, um, decided to gather a group of patients that have back pain. And for about eight weeks saw, and those people that practice mindfulness um, were able um, um, to report less pain and a lot more functionality. So it's really, as defined, mindfulness is an awareness and ability to pay attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and, and non-judgmentally. Um, again, it's paying attention in a particular way, it's on purpose, it's in the present moment, and it's non-judgmental. Um, it deepens awareness, clarity, and the acceptance of that present moment reality. And we bring our whole self to the encounter. It's our mind. It's our body. It helps us find the best response to the most negative situation possible. And it's really about trying to be open and curious and let go and very self-compassionate. And we live each moment and appreciate each moment. We live moment by moment. We live day by day. So thinking about us just being here together, learning about mindfulness, not even thinking about what we'll do in an hour from now, but just here together as we learn about mindfulness, if we practice some exercises, I'm not even thinking about doing my dishes or the rest. If, if that thought comes back, we say, ah, I note that thought, but I'm going to come back. And we're here together with the Gilded team and family, and we're just going to learn about mindfulness. So a little bit more about mindfulness. I mentioned that um, it, um, it's a long time insight meditation, um, uh, Vispana practice, which it comes, um, the foundation is very much from Buddhist and Tibetan med meditation, for example, Asia. Um, the Thai Theridian tradition and that. And um, it's not a religion per se, but it's really a practice of simply just a way of being. Um, I know some folks that worry that it, it interferes with, re with religious practice, not at all. It's meant to be a form of meditation and a way of being. And it's really um, used to enhance therapeutic growth, for example, professional development, personal development. And a per I love that this 
a description of a brain hygiene. It just cleans out and strengthens all our synaptic connections in the brain. Um, there's this cognitive attentional process that's involved. It's learning to shift our focus and attention onto an object or choice, our feelings, our emotional experience, that awareness of mind and thoughts bringing greater meaning and purpose. And that attention is purple, purposely less broader without engaging in analytic thought. It's non-judgmental. There's an awareness to the object of attention. Um, it requires far less work than traditional relaxation. With relaxation, you have to really be focused on the broad and specific techniques and strategies. And this is excellent too to completely support that. But for folks that might have a little um, challenge when it comes to relaxation, mindfulness um, might, might be an alternative strategy that one might consider um, as a result of less rigor associated with it. And again, John Kabat-Zinn, he is the, um, the scientist that was a longtime meditator, brought it to back patients and, and really um, helped develop the science when it came to health. Um, and using it with medical patients, empirically based therapy and research, um, well known, he's still around, gives a lots of talks and um, just a really uh, wonderful individual. So what's the aim? And we're gonna use a specific type of mindfulness base um, for those of you that were in the previous series might be a little bit familiar to you. Uh, it's mindfulness based cognitive therapy. So we're gonna target our thoughts. That's what that simply is. So a little bit of the thoughts that can that can interfere um, when it comes to cancer treatment, cancer um, and quality of life and well-being. Um, so A1 is really to help you recognize um, your earlier responses and respond more skillfully to that habitual uh, patterns of mind that create these emotional distress and uh, that can entangle you in persistent emotional suffering. So first, it's really about recognizing our responses. And number two is really to cultivate a new way of being, a way of being that, um, that describes these habitual patterns of mind that tend to be triggered. So trying to break that trigger process, really being thoughtful. Remember, it's about being intentional. Um, and it's a way of being that allows you to live with greater well-being, with ease and satisfaction. My goodness, life is hard enough as it is. Why are we so tough on ourselves? But for many of us, it's hard for us to provide self-care and self-compassion. And mindfulness allows you to do that. And it's a way of being that's more ready to that mind's inner wisdom. And it helps to, to become that kinder self, right? despite the emotional turmoil that, um, that we experience and especially when it comes to the cancer experience. So how does mindfulness help with stress? And this comes from um, Dr. Sears in Teesdale. Dr. Sears was actually a, a mind, mindfulness teacher of mine uh, as I took his class a, a few years back. I've known actually have done mindfulness since I was a resident, but uh, I was able to meet with Dr. Sears because he's well known for this MBCT. And uh, he was actually the bodyguard of the Dalai Lama. So a psychologist that uh, was the bodyguard to a Dalai Lama, a wonderful individual that really helped helped us to, um, to put all of these strategies into a book and um, help us to learn so that we can bring it to you. But um, he describes that when we become stressed, instead of constantly worrying and thinking about it, we can let ourselves feel. We can still, we can just allow ourselves to feel the stress in our heart, in our stomach, um, our thoughts, and the way it just is. How do we feel? And it might feel a little worse at first, right? But I'm open to it. That's what you have to think to yourself, open to it. But always it can level up and then it will come back. But once our body sensations go down, there's this chance to be able to distract ourselves with thoughts. The worry, they all lose their fuel, that, those thoughts. We feel free. Our minds become free because we're not spending so many hours of the day habitually worrying about stuff that we can't control. Once that pressure is gone, we can think about what we want to think about, what we are more open, that we are less willing to judge ourselves, but that we are willing to experience those pleasurable things in our day. And we also become more clear and conscious about work with the negative things. So it's, it's, it's a tool for working with our thoughts, but it helps us to appreciate certainly the small things in life. So it, it's big picture, but it's that focusing on those small things 
and that appreciation for the small things or little gifts in life that we have, that, that helps us towards greater healing in the long term. Um, oh, okay, so it's a healthy way to address stress. Um, we very much use our body. We're constantly checking in with our body. Um, and we use a lot of breath work. Now, just don't be um, fearful. It's not, um, even if you've had challenges uh, with breathing difficulties, um, the, the breath work is not as labored as it might be in some relaxation exercises or meditation exercise. We breathe deeply, um, and, but we're breathing um, and it's intentional because we're releasing our attention. And it's now in the present moment. So it's all about our breath work. It's breathing into our mind and body in a secret way. You let go, you find your flow. Um, this is not spin, this is just how you know it. And this was actually on a bus in, in uh, Asia, but uh, certainly that, is a, that um, is a beautiful way to describe the breath work that's involved with mindfulness. So what, here's our first strategy. It's a da daily mindful action, stop. What does stop mean? S is stop, of course, to take a breath, E, take a breath, T. O is to observe what's occurring. O is to observe what's occurring. And P is to proceed. So when we observe what's occurring, we want to know what's going on around us externally as well with our body. Am I feeling tense? Recognizing that there might be thoughts, I got to go wash my dishes after this guild is club. But we recognize it, we observe it but then we're still gonna proceed. We're gonna see what's good. We're gonna come back and we're just gonna to listen to the class and practice these exercises. So again, stop, take a breath, observe what's going around and then continue to proceed. Um, in addition, um, the ABCs of stop is to stop for awareness, it's to stop for beauty and it's to stop for compassion because you are so worth it. So this um, brings us to maybe our first exercise. So it's all about the mindful breath. So simply sit comfortably. Um, the best is to do it with your eyes closed. If you don't feel comfortable, you can leave it open, but we know that um, relaxation tends to be induced if our eyes are closed. Um, and sit reasonably straight, please. And simply direct your attention to your breathing. Breathing in through the nose. Exhaling through the mouth. And when our thoughts, emotions, and physical feelings and external sounds occur, simply accept them, note them, give them the space to come and go without judgment and in getting involved with them. I am breathing, I hear the car alarm, I note that but I return back to my breathing. This is when you notice that your attention has drifted and you become caught up in thoughts or feelings. Simply note that attention has drifted and gently bring the attention back to your breathing. It is okay and natural for our thoughts to arise and that our attention might follow them. No matter how often this occurs, simply keep bringing your attention back to your breathing. Remember when thoughts, 
emotions and any physical feeling or sound occurs. Simply accept them, note them, give them the space to come and go without any judgment or being involved with them. Gently bring the attention back to your breathing. It is okay and natural for these thoughts to arise. No matter how often this happens, simply bring your attention to your breathing. And when you are ready to rejoin this, our virtual environment, will we close, open those closed eyes and take a deep breath. That's just a breathing exercise um, for those um, that are interested in that mindful breath that's Again, it's just very easy focusing on, 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 on the breath completely, nothing else, um, as you see. What we'll do now is a three-minute breathing space. Um, so that breath work, that actually could have been in one minute. I expanded it just a little bit for three minutes. So we're going to do another three-minute breathing space. And here, we're going to notice our body sensations, our feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Um, we're going to focus on the breath again. Pay attention to one spot that rise and fall of the abdomen and the nostrils. And minute three was really expanding that awareness, expanding from breath to body as a whole. Where that mind wanders, we just brought, brought it back again and again. So we're going to take that, that, that we learned, into a body scan, okay? So again, best if you could keep your eyes open. The best um, might be to close those eyes if you're able to, if that's what's comfortable. And simply notice your body is seated wherever you are seated, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, on the floor. Your feet are placed on that floor. And simply take a few deep breaths. And as you take a deep breath, bring in more oxygen, enlivening the body, and have a sense of relaxing more deeply. As you take that deep breath, bring in more oxygen, enlivening the body, healing the body and having a sense of relaxing more deeply, more peacefully. You can note your feet on the floor, notice the sensations of your feet touching the floor, the weight, the pressure, the vibration, and the heat. You can notice your legs against the chair, 
the pressure, the pulsing, the heaviness, the lightness. Notice your back against the chair. Remember, continue to breathe, keep breathing. Bring your attention to your stomach area. If your stomach is tense or tight, take a breath. Notice your hands. Are your hands tense or tight? See if you can allow them to soften, to loosen. And notice your arms. Can you feel any sensation in your arms? Let your shoulders be soft. Notice your neck and throat. Let them be soft, relax. and soften your jaw. Let your face and facial muscles be soft. And notice your whole body present. Take one more breath. Be aware of your whole body as the best you can. Notice your body as a whole. And as you take a final breath, you bring in that oxygen, enlivening the body, bringing healing. And when you are ready to come back to our virtual environment, simply open your eyes. We'll give you a minute, but um, anyone want to share? What did people notice? What did anyone experience? Is it a sense of relaxation and smoothness? Was it kind of hard to to get um, get going a little bit? Sometimes that happens the first time one is doing this in a group setting. Even though we we might not be seeing each other, but just knowing you're in a group. There might be pressures. Maybe you're thinking about things. Try it again. You know, I, I even train oncology uh, physicians and, and fellows. And I remember having once a fellow saying I couldn't get into it, but then I tried it again, you know. And so it's just really allowing yourself that that ability to, to be open, um, not to judge yourself that you couldn't do it the first time, but to try it again in, in, in an environment where you're alone without other people. Um, and again, this will be recorded. You'll have um, some recordings. Um, as well that you'll be able to, to practice and download, okay? Um, so just a gentle reminder, um, what you affect, how you feel. So most importantly, you can change how you feel by changing what you do. Um, certainly um, it is about our thoughts, but just changing what you do. And the fact that you're here and present um, in this class is the very first step um, towards uh, uh, well-being, enhancing your well-being. Um, so some daily mini mindfulness actions that you can take. So certainly the breath work is most important. Um, mindful walking. If we were together, I would uh, make us all walk together. Um, but next time we're feeling overwhelmed, press your feet against the floor. Do you ever think about walking and, and what your feet are feeling? I know I don't until uh, before um, being introduced to mindfulness. But if you press your feet against the floor, or deliberately as you're walking, you establish a strong physical foundation. It's a balance. You're engaging the five senses, right? Hearing, touch, um, as a sight, potentially. So really being deliberate about pressing those, the feet against the floor, especially um, if you're feeling stressed, um, especially in busy work environments sometimes we are um, in, or even busy home environments. 
Um, and remember to become inquisitive if you find yourself in a dispute, whether it's a family, a colleague, maybe even our physicians, our, um, you know, our nurses, our medical team. Um, rather than argue, simply ask uh, questions. Um, by being inquisitive, we know that we can uncover new ways of surpassing roadblocks. No one can ever judge you by um, asking a question. Um, in fact, it can really diffuse a, a negative situation. And name your mood, you know, externalizing our emotions. I feel angry, I feel sad is a way to put feelings in per perspective. Um, and this is a tough exercise, but maybe, you know, with our cell phones, every hour or at least three times a day, write one word that summarizes your state of mind. And think about it that um, at, at the end of the day, you'll review your list and those worst feelings don't last. It might be a very rough day, rough morning, but by the evening, maybe there's a, a sense of peace or calm that's come over. And that's really important for us to, to know. Um, and that in order for us to remember, we always focus on the negative, it's really tough to focus on the positive. And that's for all of us. Um, and simply let it go, use a visualization exercise before especially leaving the hospital after treatment or visiting your doc or going to sleep. Imagine a box and put your problems in those box, those worries, those problems. When we do insomnia work, we make people, you know, write it down in a list and, and, and close it uh, either by throwing it away or closing it into a drawer away. Really just get, get those thoughts out there. Place those events inside this box on a list and then just visualize it flowing away. So again, the box is the easiest without having to use pen and paper or your phone, certainly. Um, but just imagine a box, place those events inside and then visualize it floating away. Remember, mindfulness is a very simple concept. The practice of simply being aware of your experience is in that present moment. It's very deliberate, very intentional, and really it's quite um, eye-opening to see. Um, what are some other daily formal mindfulness practices? So do some type of practice, no matter how brief. Um, one of the respected teachers, uh, Goldstein, had recommended that his students sit down to meditate every day, even if it's for only 10 seconds, 10 seconds to 10 minutes is his range. But just, uh, you know, close your eyes, take a deep breath. That's um, a good cleanse breath as, as we were talking. It doesn't have to be a minute, it doesn't have to be three minutes. It can only be 10 seconds or just that deep breath. Um, if at all possible, do the practice at the same time. Um, every day is um, important. So I always say breakfast, lunch, and dinner to get going and then incorporate as more as you can. Um, view the practice like caring for a plant. You have to give it a little bit of water for it to grow and flourish. And certainly see your practice as a way to nourish yourself, um, rather to be your to-do list like, oh, I have to meditate, I have to do this mindfulness. Absolutely not. Look at it as a, as a gift, a way to gift yourself and reward yourself for, um, for the day's events, that you are important, that your self-care, even 10 seconds, one minute, is very important. Um, explore ways to inspire and re-inspire yourself to practice. Um, you know, are there some motivators, um, you know, in cancer care, of course, it's always about enhancing our health and our well-being. Maybe it's just dealing with the stresses of, of the, the cancer care environment, but maybe it's even dealing with stresses of family um, and other, um, the stressors of the world, world events and, and things like that. So explore ways to practice with other people, like this virtual environment, although we wish we could be together. Um, and that, um, you know, virtual practicing with other people, this common bond that you all are trying to learn. So that's really important. And you can always begin again. Don't be tough on yourself. If you skip a day, if you skip a week, most important that, that you come back that next Monday and you start again and you try to do a breakfast, lunch, and dinner for at least 10 seconds. And then you know, it, if you make a priority, you'll you'll find additional times to incorporate it. And um, don't criticize yourself. Don't worry about things. Just why? Just begin again, um, especially with the breathing in that three-minute um, breathing space, especially if or the body scan. So some final mindfulness tips: becoming more mindful of how we proceed through our day is truly the antidote uh, to feeling like we're running in circles, right? That automatic pilot. 
um, as Dr. Sears talked about in our lives. It's that procrastinating or not getting enough sleep or exercise. And mindfulness is about being more present and aware of our behaviors in each moment. It can help us change the habits that are no longer serving us, right? Um, and they're getting rid of those, those old habits and maybe introducing new, new ways of thinking, new ways of, of coping. Um, so this is the final slide. These are some mindfulness audio recordings from Dr. Sears. Um, these are free to use, um, uh, downloading these free mindfulness recordings, um, which has this body scan, the breath, body, and sounds, and um, a, a more loving kindness. So we'll introduce you to some of these over the course, as well as some additional ones, like sitting, uh, sitting mindful meditation and others. Um, but uh, this was just kind of a really quick snapshot uh, introduction to um, mindfulness and mindfulness cognitive therapy. So I hope that we get a chance to see each other again in about two weeks time. And um, if not, I hope you'll afford yourself of the opportunity to, to go through these slides at your convenience and um, practice these exercises, um, even if you're unavailable to join us, okay? Any questions or thoughts? You know, we ran through that quickly.